Good evening. Welcome to you all. And my name is Kirsten Spencer. I am a senior lecturer at AUT, specialising in performance analysis and sports coaching. My background is such that uh, I played uh, field hockey to uh, international level and I uh, know some of your South African players. Um, but when I moved to New Zealand uh, from England, much of my early research was actually in the sport of netball. So what I've um, been invited to talk to you today uh, is about a recent piece of research where I um, looked at the injuries associated, particularly in secondary school netball. So I've titled this um, presentation Netball Happy Landings, and it's very much related to um, looking at the junior school or the secondary school netball players and then analysing their movement patterns and then correlating that with injuries that occurred. So netball currently it's a sport played by over 20 million people, more than 70 countries. Um, it's incredibly popular. Obviously in New Zealand we're quite proud of at the moment because we are netball world champions um, which is superb. So um, this is a very, um, very pertinent piece of, of research. So as you know, your netball coaches, we've got uh, specific playing positions uh, for each of the roles. And it's interesting that the playing positions, as I go through this presentation, you'll see that um, the position that you play actually does have an implication for the likelihood of injury. So the research, when you delve a bit deeper, um, shows us that netball players have a high incidence of lower limb injuries and it's generally attributed to the landing strategies used in competition. So the specific position that you play <coughs> will have a, uh, a particular contextual demand and that requirement uh, for that position will influence the landing strategies that the players choose. So in the competition environment, factors that determine landing strategy are the netball football rule, uh, sorry, footwork rule, the type of pass, so it could be a straight or a loop or a banks pass, the height of the pass, is it an overhead, is it a chest, or is it below waist, the closeness of the opposition, so is it pressure high, pressure low, and then the landing space that we have available, so is it uh, enough space for unilateral landing, bilateral landing, and what, are the, what is the action which is um, achievable in the landing space that we have. Now, here in New Zealand, it's an incredibly uh, expensive sport to the country. So in 2016, netball injuries cost uh, ACC, which is our accident compensation company, um, that actually cost New Zealand 28 million New Zealand dollars. And if we look at the stats there, you know, we'll see that most of these injuries occur to females in the 15 to 25 age bracket. Um, it's the intermediate age girls who, in, who are injured most frequently, and there's uh, a high level of reoccurrence of injury. So once you've had an injury at netball, particularly if we go for, say, for example, the ACL, there's a high likelihood of a re-rupture. So it's, uh, it's important to consider the landing aspects. It's uh, very much part, when, when I talk to the netball coaches here in New Zealand, landing strategy is very important. So a high experience of overhead passes in netball compels the netballer to jump and receive. So these jumps, which can be vertical, forward or in a lateral direction, often involve the netballer turning in the air with either a unilateral or a bilateral landing. So if you look at this video, we can see what turned out to be a nasty uh, ACL injury where we've got a netballer jumping in the air with a turn on the land and that's the result. So the, this jump and landing leads to ground reaction forces being imposed on the netballer, which can be up to 6.8 times the body mass. However, the landing strategy chosen, or as coaches that we've trained our netballers to use, has the potential to reduce these impact forces and so reduce the likelihood of or the possibility of injury. Now, research from elite adult netball uh, suggested that better players would use, so that's more elite players, would use a bilateral or a run-on strategy. And so they actually experience a lower impact ground force because the forces are spread more evenly throughout the foot. 
So learning strategy um, is known to have an impact in terms of likelihood of injury. So the problem which um, I looked at, uh, that we've got seven positions in netball. You know, do they all land the same? So we're looking to determine the distribution of landing strategies in high level youth national competition. So this is the national secondary schools competition. And then the aim is that the information that we gathered from this on the distribution will assist netball coaches and SNC professionals to develop conditioning strategies for injury prevention and performance improvement from a position specific perspective. So we've got the does everybody land the same? Can we can we actually determine that there's a difference for landing strategy by grade? So in the secondary school netball competition, as you'll see, we have three different grades. And then how do we apply this knowledge that we've picked up or that we've learned from this into um, the actual sport? You know, how, how do we actually implement this in terms of our coaching and training sessions? So I worked with um, a trained biomechanist, so a colleague of mine, Associate Professor Chris Watman, and um, uh, one of the um, professors uh, from the health faculty, uh, Duncan Reed, and we looked at the learning strategies of 84 female netballers, and it was from 12 competitive games, and uh, the data was from those who are in the elite level, so that's the first grade, and then the third grade, who are the two two levels below, and we looked at landing strategy based upon their playing position. So the variables, which were uh, the, what we call the dependent variables, um, were context. So what was the context of the um, the landing strategy of the netball player? Right? Which zone were they in? How much pressure were they under? Okay. How did they receive the ball? So these these are all the factors that that vary. So how did they receive the ball? How many hands did they use to receive the ball? What height did they get to? Uh, where was the ball in relation to where they received it? Um, relative to the body, and then what type of movement? Then from the jumping perspective, we looked at what was the direction of jump. Was it forward or was it lateral? Then landing, we looked at direction. Then we then looked at ankle movement, foot movement. And then for balance, we looked at stability or instability. So balance is important because it, it contributes to the effective execution of the landing strategy. So whatever the netball player chooses, the ability to land in a stable position um, has uh, great benefits towards reducing the likelihood of injury. So assessment of frequency of stability and unstable movements has been advocated as a good injury uh, risk um, assessor. <coughs> so three strategies we found were used to help maintain balance. It was either what we referred to as the ankle strategy. Okay, this is often used in static conditions where, for example, you know, if we're talking basketball, the guard defense in the end zone, where a static balance is held for three seconds without falling into the opponent and creating an infringement. In dynamic situations, the ankle strategy is there to try to recover stability and it's used when the disturbance to balance is minimal. Um, the other strategy that we have is the hip strategy. Netballers would use this hip strategy to recover balance when they've made sort of large or fast corrections which are needed um, from the mediolateral and anterior posterior instability. So for example, if we put that into sort of coaching terminology, when we've had a netball player who's done a jump or a jump turn on landing, that's a high level of instability and the netball player would use their hips to try to maintain balance upon landing. Now the stepping strategy, this generally indicates that the netball has failed to regain balance using either the ankle or the hip. So you'll see this when you have a netball player who jumps, they then land, they've tried to either use their ankle to stabilize themselves or they've made a much bigger movement with their hips to try to stabilize themselves. They've still got motion moving forwards, so then they take another step. And generally speaking, the research suggests that that step strategy is synonymous with a lower skill level of landing. So to move on to our study then, this is what we looked at in our analysis. So we had descriptive data. Then we looked at uh, the difference between positions. So we use what... Oh, 
we, we looked at the differences to see if there's actually any statistical difference between them. Then for the second stage, we wanted to try to see if there was um, if we could predict the grade of the netballer based upon the landing strategy that was used. So we said, OK, if you're in grade A, you're going to be a better player than if you're in grade C. So if we took all of the results anonymously to grade and we then looked at, OK, which which landing strategy was used by which players, we wanted to see if actually the better players or the more elite players did use different landing strategies. So we looked across the whole netball tournament and we looked at this distribution of landing strategies. OK, player level, as I said, was either recorded as grade A or grade C. We then did some analysis so we could then try to determine, OK, actually, does this landing strategy, does it differ with uh, what you might refer to as skill level um, or talent level of the individual? OK, so the interesting bit, if we look at the results, then we got quite a few because we had a number of those independent variables. So the first thing we looked at uh, was context. So you'll see here that we've got um, all of the positions uh, across the top here. OK, and I've sort of tried to just highlight in this what are the, the interesting findings. <coughs> so if we look initially, we'll see on this then that the uh, goal attack and goal shooter fairly normal here, they predominantly receive in the circle zone. The goal attack, significantly greater ball reception uh, than the goalkeeper over the time frame of this study. So it's important really to take a consideration as to who's going to receive the ball more. And it could be different uh, for the players that you're working with. But for this secondary score competition, we found the goal attack receives the ball significantly more than the goalkeeper. So therefore, if we're looking at injury likelihood, um, the goalkeeper is going to potentially do less movements, record less number of movements, so they are less likely to be injured. <coughs> now, this is a competition which runs across one whole week. So these are secondary school athletes, and they will be playing netball on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So I can assure you by the end of the week, there's a high level of injury. Because these athletes are not actually... they're the training status is probably not enough for them to be able to cope with the intensity of the games that they're playing. <coughs> so if we look at the the uh, next context, so we're looking at the end third. OK, so what we find here, the goalkeeper receives a ball significantly less again uh, than either the centre, the goal attack or the wing attack. Um, it's important that we start to consider this because it's it's come up a few times that the goal attack actually um, does significantly less work. Uh, sorry, not the goal attack. The goalkeeper does significantly less uh, work than potentially some other positions. And again, this may not be the case in your teams, but this was uh, what we found in our secondary school competition. So from a coaching and SNC perspective, the coach needs to be aware of this in the uh, sort of design of training environments and to think about the expectations of work rate across this week long tournament duration. So if we've got athletes, netball players who are used to playing one or two games a week, you know, across seven days, and then they're into this high intense environment where they are playing um, at least five matches across the course of the week. <coughs> then what we find is that there is a much greater likelihood of injury because the training that the athletes have been doing with the coaches actually hasn't really prepared them enough for this increase in intensity. So if we look at the number of landings okay, that we have here in the end third, so we can see here in the end third that we've got the uh, centre and the wing attack they, they have significantly more landings than the goal defence, the goal shoot, the wing defence in the end zone. So when we're working with these two players, the centre and the wing attack, and I have quite a few discussions um, with uh, Netball, uh, particularly with the, the analysts at Netball, and this is a frequent occurrence. So your centre and your wing attack are the two players who have a, a much uh, greater workload than other players on the court. Um, what was interesting for this study was that the previous research suggested that the centre player would actually um, have uh, more landings in the midcourt, 
whereas our research found that our centre player actually had more landings in the end third. So again, when we're looking at designing our training patterns, there's a need here for us to consider how are we designing our training sessions so that our centre player becomes uh, more um, practised at receiving the ball in that end third, uh, whereas the research previous to this would have suggested most of their uh, reception would be in the mid-court. So if we look at the mid-court, there are actually no significant differences there. So whilst we've got goal defence and we've got wing defence have predominantly greater reception in the mid-court, there's actually no difference between the positions. So that mid-court zone, where traditionally the research suggests that the centre player really uh, has the outstanding actions, our research found that this was not the case and that for the mid-court players there was actually no, no significant difference um, between the frequency of um, reception and landing uh, for our particular players. So if we look then at pressure, we can see that the pressure, um, the players when they are receiving their passes, this is so you want to look at this, 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 this numbers as it's the net ball of receiving the ball. How much pressure are they under? It's either high, medium or low. And if we look here at the centre player, we'll see that mainly in our tournament, and again, it may not be the same for, for you in South Africa here, but mainly for our players, the, the pressure is classed as, is classed as medium. Um, and it's sort of medium or low for most of the players. There's not a great deal of, of high intensity pressure, even at this secondary schools competition. So for the, the, the pressure is, is an important uh, point to consider. And it's, it's quite important to consider this when you're discussing players who are in the uh, elite levels at secondary school, and they might be thinking of making the next step up or they're in the secondary school, uh, they're in playing for their, their state side um, and they are looking to, to develop because the previous research suggests that pressure on the receiver is often uh, attributed as a, as a mechanism for ACL injury. So the results suggest from this study that medium to low pressure is the main experience of our players in all positions in the New Zealand National Schools netball competition. So this is actually conflicting with the experience that happens at elite level, where there's regular indirect contact occurring as the receiver um, gets the ball as a result of very high defensive pressure. You only have to have a look at the matches uh, between, uh, well, between South Africa, England, uh, Australia and New Zealand to appreciate how the, the, high, um, the high pressure on the receiver Often you see it as a, a hit or a shove or the physical body contact. So when we're, when we're thinking about designing our training programs for our youngsters, it's something we need to consider here. We need, it's, it's, it's useful or a necessity, I should say, really, for the coaches of our school level to increase the frequency of pressure scenarios on the receiver in training. Because we need to allow the player to develop these effective landing strategies based on this relationship between um, environmental task constraints, decision making and, in, and injury. So we want our players to be practicing the strategies which are going to reduce the likelihood of injury as they progress to international level. So if we summarise context then. The zones where these landing strategies occurred, are pre they're predominantly differentiated by position. The goal shooter, the goal attack and the goalkeeper are predominantly active in the circle zone. The centre and wing attack are mainly active in the end zone and the goal defence and wing defence are principally active in the midcourt. So due to the movement restrictions placed on each position by the rules of the game, the goal shooter and goalkeeper zones, they're as expected, but the centre player's greater involvement in the end zone is contrary to previous research, which states that the midcourt is normally the main area of engagement and landing for centre players. So this suggests that when you're planning tactical training sessions, coaches, you want to start to consider planning actions that involve the centre player as receiving the ball in the end zone much more frequently than receiving it in the midcourt position, because that would allow you to replicate the, in the training environment actually what's going to happen uh, in the match environment. 
So if we look at receiving then, so this is the how did the players actually receive the ball. So we've got the centre, the goal attack, the wing attack significantly received the ball with two hand catches compared to the goal defence and goal shooter. Now you're all netball coaches, so you'll be thinking, OK, that makes great sense. Got to got to protect the ball, uh, make sure you've got a firm hold of it. Goal defence, goal shooter, tending to receive the ball um, in a position where the, the, the height is, is an important reception. You know, and again, uh, there's the uh, Jamaican uh, player who is incredibly tall and she puts up one hand and that hand outstretches everybody else. So she has a really good opportunity uh, to just stick up one hand and to receive the ball. If we look at um, where the ball is received, OK, then we've got the centre, the goal attack and the wing attack. They tend to receive significantly more passes than the uh, more overhead passes than the goalkeeper. And if we look then at the leg movement, OK, so we are looking at the type of movement that is uh, occurring as the player receives the ball. So we'll see here that we've got the leap step. And we've got stationary, so that's a player standing still. This is the player who is leaping and then doing a step action. So the leap step uh, receiving action is most frequently used by the wing attack in the centre. Now, when we start to relate this to injury, it's important that you appreciate this and you think, think now about your training environment because this is the movement which requires a large degree of stability on landing. And it's been associated with a very high injury risk. So the leap step very important implications for coaches and conditioners is to increase your player awareness and training to try to use the hip balance strategy okay to reduce instability on landing because this lessens the likelihood of injury from this action so you're trying to get the players to consider their balance by sort of uh, considering about uh, where do they lean over their hip are they leaning outside of their body line so you're asking the players, instead of doing a leap, uh, as they do a leap and a step, to really think about focusing on that central core and the hip strategy to try to reduce any likelihood um, of injury. Regardless of position, players at this level are principally static. So this, as I said, it's the netball secondary schools competition. This is the top players in the secondary school age in New Zealand. And regardless of whatever position they were, most of them, or most of them are receiving the ball from a static position. Now, this reduces the impact of the footwork rule and suggests that deceleration may not be such a mitigating factor in injuries at this age group. If we take this to the next level, which is the elite level, where we have a lot of ball reception at a high speed, where deceleration is an important factor, then what we find is that the results will suggest that actually most of the passes are received on the move and deceleration then comes into um, the requirements of the athlete in order to stop effectively. So if we look at the types of jump then that we that, that occur, so we we have the options of vertical, lateral, forward, jump in, uh, jump, turn in the air, or jump, land, pivot. Okay, the most prevalent jump involved was a forward direction with the wing attack, centre and wing defence, all experiencing significantly more, lack, more actions at this than players in the goal defence and goal shoot position. So this jumping and jumping with a forward direction, okay, you're all netball coaches, you're thinking, okay, that again, that's nothing new, that makes great sense. You know, it's probably due to the limitations of space in a circle area. But in terms of implications for injury, the resultant posterior ground reaction force right, required by these players to slow their horizontal momentum may actually increase the external flexion at the knee. This ultimately, unfortunately, may act as a mechanism for ACL injury. So implications for you coaches, for SNC um, coaches or conditioners, is that you should actually try to encourage a bilateral or a run-on strategy whilst training in order to lower these ground reaction forces generated on these knees when they, la when they make a forward jump. Now, the jump turn in the air 
Interestingly, all the players used a jump turn in the air land strategy rather than the pivot landing. So this suggests a possible coaching intervention to reduce the use of this strategy, which actually leads to instability issues in landing. So the video that we saw at the very start, uh, one of the ANZ players jumped, turn in a land ACL injury. Okay, when we're working with our youngsters, perhaps instead of um, working so hard on the jump, turn in the air land strategy, um, we should be encouraging more of the pivot landing. So if we move on to landing, we've got um, ankle joint movement options, and then we've got movements of the feet. So netballers predominantly landed with their foot in plantar flexion. Okay, so regardless of your position, generally you're going to be landing with your foot in that position of plantar flexion. Okay, generally speaking, it was the result showed it was going to be landing on the right leg. So you're plantar flexed, uh, single foot on your right leg when they were landing uh, on a symmetrical basis uh, sorry when they were landing with two legs there was a tendency regardless of their position that they would have a symmetrical base now again when you look at the research for elite players the symmetrical base is one which is not actually prevalent because the asymmetrical base leads to your ability to hold a greater space so therefore put yourself in a better position from receive turn shoot whereas if you're in a symmetrical position you don't have the opportunity to make the move forward um, towards the shooting hoop so when we look at balance um, the landing tended to be a dominant balance on the right leg so as the players receive the ball um, if there's an element of instability then there's a tendency to sway on over onto the right leg this could be because most uh, most players are right-handed. Um, it could be that you know if they're right uh, right side dominant, then that's the actions that they're used to. Again, there's a cause for concern here that with the dominant balance being on the right leg, it would be important to actually try to um, potentially uh, consider that in training so that you can uh, give the athletes the best opportunity to be able to sway left or sway right as it, as is required so for the uh, stabilization actions what we found with our players in new zealand here is that the wing attack center and goal attack use significantly more ankle balance strategy than the other positions so we've got the um uh, the players as they're landing tending to sw either if they're feeling unstable, they tend to sway onto the right side and that final stabilization tends to come from ankle movements. Now, again, when I actually look back at the ACC, which is our accident uh, statistics, um, there is a high incidence of ankle injuries in netball. So netball tends to be an ankle injury uh, or it uh, tends to be an ACL injury. So the um, static receiving may explain which we spoke about earlier that actually may explain this high incidence of this ankle strategy because if you're not on the move when you're landing then it takes a smaller mechanism to, to maintain that stable balance so that's potentially one of the reasons why the ankle stabilization strategy uh, was used most frequently throughout this secondary schools tournament now the least um, strategy used was the step strategy from the perspective of the research and injury, this is a strategy with the uh, reduced likelihood of injury. So if you're looking to try to reduce injuries amongst your squad, then the step strategy is the one which the research supports uh, that you practice. It's a difficult skill to master because of the step work rule, uh, the footwork rule. So, so implications are there for technique improvement uh, when you're designing your coaching sessions. And I think it's an awareness issue here that when you're working with your athletes to try to get them to think about how do they stabilize themselves when they're landing. <coughs> so as I said, the second part of our study was to try to consider whether if we took these landing strategy variables and we, we then used those to see if we could predict which grade were the sample players in. So we use this thing called a logistic regression, right? and we identified uh, a few variables which were the ones which enabled us to predict grade. 
So we've got the more catching with both hands, the fewer jump turn in air lands, and the more balance using step strategy, and the less landing neutral feet wide outside border. These were the four variables which enabled uh, our model to correctly predict the grade of the player. Now this model actually predicted 88% right, in terms of grade. So when you're looking from a uh, sort of, not necessarily a selection criteria, but when you're looking at players and you're thinking about how can you help that player to improve from a coaching perspective, okay, more catching with both hands, more using the balance uh, step in order to stabilize yourself, fewer landing with a neutral feet outside of your uh, body's border, and fewer jump turning airs, that would be the um, suggestion that that's what elite players or the better players tend to use. So uh, basically fewer rotational jumps and wider base landings were associated with a higher grade. Okay, so practical applications. And I've tried to sort of talk about the coaching applications as we've gone through this presentation. And, you know, coaches and conditioners, it's really important that we, we design the training environment to embrace these learning strategies and look at how they're associated with each specific position. So we've, we sort of suggested some coaching implications, which in our discussions with Netball New Zealand, you know, they've been thinking about. And it would be to encourage players to use jumps which are direct, i.e. non-rotational. Uh, try and encourage them to do this as frequently as possible. And discouraging a, a wide base on landing uh, using a balance step, right, to try to reduce the strain on the body. When you're selecting teams for matches and tournaments, Coaches and conditioners need to prepare each athlete for the demands of the position that they play and to not rely on a general level of physical conditioning. And it's incredibly important in this that you think about, you know, you've got a week for our athletes here. This is a week long tournament and they don't usually play week long tournaments apart from this particular one. And the physios are incredibly busy at the end of this week uh, because of the high number of injuries. So it's important across a tournament where due to this increased intensity and duration with a very high uh, injury risk, that if coaches are rotating players into a different position in a match and these players have not trained particularly for a long period of time in these different positions, then it's really important that the coaches um, hopefully you know, with this presentation, are a little bit more aware of the detrimental impact that the variation of landing strategies for position will actually have on the player's performance when placed in what I refer as to as their non-usual position. So these are the references which I've used to form some of the basis of this presentation. Um, thank you very much. And I think... Um, well, but now uh, we have an opportunity for some questions. Uh, so again, thank you very much, and I've, I hope you enjoyed it. I have related it to uh, the work we've been doing here in New Zealand with secondary schools, um, but I think the concepts of how to analyse the jumping and landing is something which um, transcends uh, countries. So I've been working very closely uh, with Netball New Zealand um, in terms of looking at these different uh, landing strategies. And we've been, take, we've been doing this at a younger age group as well. So this is a piece of work, as I said, which uh, aimed at the secondary school age um, in our national competition. But what we're doing here in New Zealand is looking to take some of these concepts and see if we can implement it in our junior coaching programs so that we have athletes who are better prepared and less likely to be injured in, as they develop. Thank you very much.